part of our Cadbury FC Roadshow. Can you please welcome back out Emma, Karen, and Eam? Right. We got our Guinness. We got our Guinness. We'll Emma, get you one soon. Emma, I think this is on you. <laughs> you got your Guinness. <laughs> that was his fault, by the way. <laughs> you can blame him. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have to tell you, you. I've, I've never been more impressed with Ian Wright in my life. We got our pints of Guinness. <laughs> and a uh, request from him, by the way. And he took one gulp and it went to there. And I was like, <laughs> that'll do. <laughs> I, I, don't like, I don't like when it, I like when it's still fermenting. I like to smash it down to about there <laughs> when it's still doing its thing. I love it. John Aldridge got me. You remember that night when England threw all the seats down and that? I remember John Aldridge, I was there. And John Aldridge took me to that pub in Lansdowne Road. I must have had seven pints. It was the first time I ever drank Guinness. And I've been addicted to it ever since. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I'd forgotten you were there that night, so that's interesting. There wasn't animosity between the players over that night at all. Of course there wasn't. Yeah. It's just the idiots. <laughs> yeah. Where were you when that all kicked? Were you on the pitch or coming on? I was in the pub, mate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michael Owen on stage, your time at England over cross briefly? Or? Yeah, um, it's funny because like, I remember like, my, I heard Michael talking about Glenn Odell and Glenn Odell was the manager that kind of gave me a, a really good run for England. And it's funny because um, he told me I was going to the 98 World Cup, you know what I mean? And um, I remember Michael just come in. How was you, you Mike? 18, you know? yeah. And uh, Michael just came in and he, he already told me that you're going to be going and this and that. But he's going to say, he said to me, you're going to play 45 minutes and then I'm going to bring the youngster guy on. I think Dion Dublin was in the squad as well. But then, you know, Knowing that you're going to the World Cup, and I missed that. I missed all of them. I missed in 1990. I missed that one because Bobby Robson said, because I broke my leg twice for, for that FA Cup final with Man United. He said he didn't think I was going to be fit enough. Then they didn't take me in '92 when I won the Golden Boot in England. '94 we didn't qualify. '96 Terry Venables left me out the, the day before they went to leave to go to um to the to the dentist chair in Hong Kong and that. And then '98, like 45 minutes. I was going to play 45 minutes, 35 minutes. I was chasing the ball down the, the, the left back, done my hamstring. And then that's when um, Michael came in. So everything that happened, like Michael going on, Scott, this because of me. <laughs> Cheers. And how do you look back at the time now, Ian? Do you feel like you didn't get a good crack at it? Is there... Any, I suppose, not bitterness, but you look back and say, geez, I wish I got more of a chance there. What, of England? Mm -hmm. No, nah, no, nah, because coming in as, as late as I did, I don't think you can be somebody that says, oh, he should have played me more and this and that. I was just grateful for the opportunity. There was a couple of games I played for England early doors. I played against Norway and I played against Russia. Missed two very good chances against Norway. And then this fella from Russia just marked me out the game, couldn't get a touch. And then you've got people like, like Alan Shearer was just coming in and doing his stuff and Andy Cole and you know th there was so many people that if you miss Robbie Fowler you know so many people if you miss the chance in that then there's somebody else waiting so I didn't take that opportunity so I can't look back now and say oh Graham Taylor should have given me more I'm delighted with the 33 caps I didn't even think I was going to get to England you know what I mean at 21 you know what I mean so I can't I'm not I'm, I would not sit here and say oh I should have got more more caps fuck that <laughs> When, when Ian was on earlier, he was describing his favourite goal and talked us through it in perfect detail and instinctive. And I'm just curious, if you, you can swap notes. When you were in one-on-one, -on -one, Michael, what were you thinking? What were you, where were you in your head? Was it all instinctive or did you have it all planned out and trained? Or how did you go about your business? Well, I think, first of all, 
if Wrighty was uh, playing nowadays, I think it's fair to say that he'd be getting more than 33 caps because he was in a generation, that generation that you just mentioned, of yeah. Andy Cole, Robbie Fowler, Shearer, Sharing. I mean, it was unbelievably competitive. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's uh, certainly fair to say. But no, goal scoring is... Um, mm -hmm. Goal scoring is a really interesting thing because I think there's certain goals that are very instinctive and I think there's certain finishes that, that you can practice under pressure. And I think if you look at someone like Mo Salah at the moment, nobody would have, <laughs> nobody would have had him as a great finisher eight years ago. And now you look at him and he's a great yeah. finisher in certain aspects. Um, <laughs> now... I think <laughs> when I was a kid, when I was a kid, going through one-on-one -on -one was something that I was put in the position a lot of times. So I was fast um, as a kid, so a ball over the top, and I would naturally have time in front of goal. Now, I found that I didn't like going around the goalkeeper, mm. just my personal preference. I mm. felt as if taking a big touch and then dinking the goalkeeper was better, or a slot. Some people just love going around the goalkeeper. But... It's trial and error with finishing. The worst thing that I think happened to me was because I was quicker than everyone as a kid, I could always take a touch, put it exactly where I want. So I never practiced with my left foot. It was never like, you're getting chased, it's got to be on your left foot, you've got to finish it. So I think that almost hindered me from a left foot point of view, but it certainly helped me in terms of finding out what my best finish was. Um, and as I say, I always found that slotting the ball, looking at the goalkeeper, you're in control. The, the, the basis of, of finishing is you're in control running towards the goalkeeper. You can put him wherever you want. I can change an angle. I can take a touch there, there, there. He's going to have to react to what I do. So I'm in control. But also, I'm waiting for the goalkeeper to give me a, give me a, a, a bit of hope. Because if they get their angles right, it's very difficult to score against Peter Schmeichel or David Seaman or players like that. They're massive. So you need them to get something slightly wrong. You need to take a big touch for them to think, oh, he's made a bad touch. Mm -hmm. Sprint out, dive at your feet. No, 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 I'm a little bit quicker than you give me credit for. I'll dink <laughs> you. So you're always looking to either put them in a wrong position, uh, and that comes with time and practice. Instinctive finishing <coughs> is different, um, and that's when you just have a feel for where the ball's going to land the majority of the time, and you're in the right position, moving on to it at the right time. Um, so there's lots, when someone says, oh, is he a good finisher? I sometimes say, well, he's good at certain finishes, but he's got no instinct whatsoever to score a goal. So there's, there's different types of, of finishing, but I think, um, I think the one-on-ones was something that I'd probably mm -hmm. practice more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Emma, then one-on-one -on -one as a goalkeeper, Emma, <laughs> what are you doing? What's going through your mind? Well, it, it's, it's like what Michael says, that the advantage is with the striker. And you know that as a goalkeeper. And you have to make a decision. The, the best goalkeepers make the right decisions, basically. And when to, to close down the ball, when to mm -hmm. stay back. Um, that's changed a little bit in time as well. Dependent, like the speed of the game has, has grown. Goalkeepers don't tend to come out as quickly as they used to. They tend to kind of stay in the six-yard box. But for me, it was always about, you know, watching the forward. I would never, as what Michael said, I would never give them the advantage by making the decision for them. That's the first thing. Let Make them make the decisions. Um, and, you know, if they have a bad touch, yes, I will start to move out. But I never commit myself. Stay big. Um, and I was always really quick as well. Not, maybe not as quick as you, but <laughs> um, I was quick. So I, I, I was always able to, to cover space. And if they moved the ball, I could move with them. That's probably one of my advantages. Was one of my, not anymore, <laughs> was one of my advantages. But it's all about, you know, learning that. And it's difficult when you don't have the coaches to tell you that. We're going back to women's football. I mean, I was really lucky. I had a top, top class goalkeeping coach. Um, and then I did my badges, so I understood what it was to be a goalkeeper and the good time, the proper times to go out, and what it was like to be a forward coming in, because you learn that as a coach. Yeah. So I knew kind of what to do, but a lot of goalkeepers don't have that. And as I said, things have changed as well. The best keepers stay, like Ter Stegen will stay, and he'll make those instinctive saves, he'll let them come in. 
Um, whereas we, was, uh, we were always taught to go out and try to delay them and wait till your defenders get back. But now goalkeepers are staying back a little bit longer and inviting the players in. In uh, Erling Haaland, when he ran in behind West Ham uh, in the first week of the season, the second goal, Dion Dublin was the match of the day. And he was saying, as Haaland was running around to get onto his left foot, he said, this is him slowing down. And it strikes from afar that staying calm and actually slowing yourself down while moving at a high speed is like the trick. <laughs> yeah, but the thing with, um, when you look at Erling Haaland, when you look how he scores his goals um, and how he broke through there, he broke through with such pace and time that he had so much time to be able to go round onto his left foot. The goalkeeper couldn't stop it. And like, like Emma's saying there, and like Michael said, um, it's all about the, the forwards in, in, in total control. Goalkeepers are waiting for you to make a bad touch so they could come out and smother it. And the striker, you're, if, if you've got the, the, the right touches, it's like I've watched, what goal? Uh, Gabriel Martinelli scored a goal a little while back against Chelsea where he ran from the halfway line, Kante slipped. And I remember it because I was doing it. He had five touches. And what, by the time he got to the goalkeeper, the goalkeeper still couldn't do nothing. He was just standing there because if you get the touches right, the goalkeepers can't do anything. They can't do anything. Dave Seaman used to always say to me, I'm waiting for you to have a bad touch. I want you to go on to your... <laughs> <laughs> I want you to go to your weak foot. I want you to have the bad touch so as I could come out and smother it. I think Michael done himself a little bit of disservice because he said he didn't work a lot on his left foot, but I've not seen anyone. I saw the goal he scored. Remember the, 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 the Man United, Man City when you, you know, like, I think Sean was trying to come back and tackle you. He had two touches and then the finish with the outside of his right foot mm. is the kind of finish that you do when yes, you might not be confident on your left foot because of what he, like he said, because when he was younger. But I've never seen anyone finish as, as clinically as Michael on his outside of his right foot. It's something that I wouldn't do because, well, it's quite good on my left foot. <laughs> <laughs> but Michael, Michael done, Michael done the kind of finishes with his right foot that I would love to have done. He, done some, he scored some beautiful goals. And was, was there an FA Cup final with a very good finish on your left foot, I think, as well? Do you know the yeah. service to yourself there? <laughs> <clears throat> some I don't know how Dave Seaman doesn't save Arsenal that. Every time I see that, I don't know how Dave Seaman doesn't save that, I Mike. I can't believe I it. Yeah, I mean, I could strike the ball. I could strike the ball with my left foot, but if I could have one thing back, I would have... If I was teaching any young kids now, it would be... It's okay striking a ball, but if you can manipulate the ball with both feet as well, then you're on to mm. a winner. And I couldn't really do that, but yeah, I could strike one, thankfully. Yeah.